Welcome, everybody. My name is Michael Suarez. I'm the director of Rare Book School, and it's my great privilege to welcome you to this, our third lecture of the 2022 summer season. I'd like to begin by asking you all, please, to silence your cell phones ahora mismo now. Thanks. Today's lecture has been sponsored by the National Endowment for the Humanities and is part of Rare Book School's Global Book Histories Initiative, a program that's been running for quite a number of years now, and we're extremely grateful to the NEH for helping us to diversify our offerings, both in terms of lectures and indeed in terms of our courses at Rare Book School. Our speaker this evening, Kelly Weisscup, is the author of an assembled use, assembled for use, indigenous compilation and the archives of early Native American literatures from Yale University Press 2021, which has attracted great praise. This year, 2022, she published as co-editor with Lisa Brooks, Plymouth Colony, Narratives of English Settlement and Native Resistance from the Mayflower to King Philip's War. This in the highly prestigious Library of America series. Her 2013 book, Medical Encounters, Knowledge and Identity in Early American Literatures, shows how medical knowledge served as a form of communication among colonists, Native Americans and African Americans. She has also published a scholarly edition. We like scholarly editions here at Rare Book School. She has also published a scholarly edition of Edward Winslow's The Good News from New England. Kelly Wisecup is Associate Professor of English at Northwestern University where she is also affiliated with the Center for Native American and Indigenous Research, which I believe you formally directed. She currently directs several grant-funded collaborations among university faculty, students, and indigenous organizations at the intersections of archives, rivers, cities, and indigenous literatures. Among her many distinctions, Professor Wisecup is on the board of American Literature. She is an elected member of the American Antiquarian Society, which is a big deal indeed, and is currently serving on the executive committee of the Society of Early Americanists. Please join me in welcoming Professor Wisecup. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, thanks to all of you for coming at the end of a long Wednesday. I'm just going to make sure you all can hear me OK. OK, if you can't hear in the back or anywhere, just please let me know. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here. Thank you to Michael and the RBS staff for the introduction. I've taken a couple of RBS courses, um, and it feels like such an honor to come back and give a talk. Um, and to be able to meet and chat with a few of you. I want to thank especially Laura and Adam for their help with logistics and making sure I didn't lose my way this morning, um, and to Ben and Kathy for letting me sit in on their courses. Um, today, I'm going to talk about some recent work on how indigenous people engaged with archives in the 18th and 19th centuries, and also how indigenous books made it to the archives where they reside today. One of the really central things in that process of research has been thinking really carefully about the indigenous homelands on which um, archives and libraries reside. So I want to acknowledge that we're on the homelands of the Monacan Nation. Um, I spent some time last night learning about some work that UVA has done to connect with uh, tribal nations in Virginia. So I'm excited to know about those um, relationships and I'm excited to follow their progress. So my talk tonight is about making and reading indigenous archives, a phrase by which I mean a couple of things. First, my interests are in how indigenous people made archives in the 18th and 19th centuries. 
Here I mean a couple of things. I mean things like the repositories of letters and governing documents and peace medals that indigenous nations kept um, in their own homes and in their tribal governing offices in the 18th and 19th centuries and used to negotiate with the US federal government. I also mean things like the archival practices that native people applied to the page. And I'll talk more about what I mean by this in a little bit. Second, I'm interested in the practices with which scholars in a range of fields might read in the archives of indigenous literature that exist within national, local, private, and public institutions. So I want to start by talking through the stakes of some methodological questions and then turn to pursue those questions by looking at two instances of indigenous communities reading and making archives in the 19th century. So I want to begin by pondering with you an entry in a massive bibliography of indigenous language books. I feel like Rare Book School is the place where I can actually begin with a bibliography and people will know what I mean, so I'm very excited about this. Um, this bibliography is created and print, published at the end of the 19th century by a clerk at the Bureau of American Ethnology, James Pilling. Uh, in addition to his bureaucratic duties as clerk, Pilling was pursuing a bibliographic project centered on books containing content in indigenous languages. He is describing word lists attained from the Bureau's collectors. He's examining library and privately held editions of vocabulary books, and he's acquiring vocabulary lists for the Bureau's collections. Pilling and the Bureau at this moment are seeking to make an archive of native books and word lists before supposedly authentic native people vanished. By this, the Bureau was imagining that authenticity meant unchanged by Western influence. So changing was vanishing for the Bureau. Pilling's project is one of salvage bibliography, a collecting of documents grounded in the premise that soon libraries and books would be the only places where colonists could encounter indigenous people and languages. And one result of Pilling's work uh, was a bibliography of books in North American indigenous languages. It grew to such an unwieldy size that it was eventually published piecemeal as smaller language family specific volumes. And one of those only slightly smaller volumes, the 1891 Bibliography of Algonquian Languages, Pilling included an entry on Samson Occam. Occam is the Mohegan minister whose execution sermon for the Wampanoag man Moses Paul, published in 1792, was a bestseller. He's also cited as the first native person to publish a printed work in English. He is a founder of the Brothertown Indian Nation, which was formed in New York in the 1770s and 80s, with a goal of moving beyond uh, the reach of colonial dispossession. Uh, it was subsequently removed again, and the Brothertown Indian Nation is a state-recognized tribe within the state of Wisconsin today. Pilling's entry for Occam reads, Occam Sampson, C. Edwards J. And you can see this on the top left here. So if we follow Pilling's direction and we turn to the entry for the famous Puritan minister, Jonathan Edwards, we find a description for Occam's execution sermon several editions of which have been printed with new title pages and compiled with Edwards' book on the Mohican language, though, as Pilling noted, the sermon and the observations were often found separate from one another. This is an image of the edition of the sermon. Pilling's bibliographic entry reflects some of the ways that Native American literatures were being read, reprinted, and described in the 19th century, and it refracts earlier historiographic practices into bibliographic categories. Let me explain what I mean by this. Pilling's redirection from Occam to Edwards accords with how antiquarian collectors and historians were printing some of Occam's manuscripts and locating him in histories of the Northeast. Starting in the late 18th century, so about a, a century before Pilling, and around the time of Occam's death in 1792, the Massachusetts Historical Society began acquiring and reprinting some of Occam's work in its journal called Collections of the Massachusetts Historical Society. The, the Society's collections, uh, and its collecting, and its journal, it's part of a larger effort to create a stable archive of the region's history and the origins of the United States, mostly by reprinting accounts of colonial ministers and missionaries. This is a project that book historian Lindsay DeKerchy calls antiquarian reprinting, and it worked to locate the Northeast's history and literature in works written by Puritan ministers like John Eliot, Roger Williams, Experience Mayhew, and Jonathan Edwards. One consequence of making this print archive was to establish a select set of colonists as central figures and sources for the Northeast's cultural and literary history, while also making their writings newly accessible for research and citation. 
And in fact, the earliest bibliographies of Occam by the novelist John William de Forest and the minister William de Las Love, both published in the 19th century, drew extensively on the collections for their source material. Um, you can see here that de Forest says that he drew uh, most of his materials for his sketch of the indigenous peoples of Connecticut from the collections of the MHS. So it might not be a surprise then that in these bi biographies, history begins with the arrival of English colonists at Plymouth and that Occam's life is figured in relationship to the colonial ministers who began preaching to his community at Mohegan in the early 18th century. So the redirection from Occam to Edwards in Pilling's bibliography echoes these earlier antiquarian practices of archive making. Citational practices hardened across the 19th century into bibliographic categories as 19th century bibliography recapitulated 18th century antiquarian reprinting. If a century earlier in the MHS collections, works by ministers like Edwards and others were important literary works and contextual materials, Pilling's List worked to make their works into bibliographic and historical categories for native literatures. So I'm interested in this moment in Pilling, um, not just from the perspective of a scholar who is interested in describing how people made and used documents like lists, although I am that person, um, or from the perspective of someone who's written on Samson Occam and his writing, although I am that person too. I'm also interested in this moment from the perspective of a scholar who works frequently and extensively in archives like the Massachusetts Historical Society and others to locate and read the indigenous books, manuscripts, and representations held within them. I am a non-native scholar. My training is in early American studies and native studies. And one of the things I was taught to do was to use archives like the MHS as my source base for establishing the context of the works I'm interpreting and for tracking the histories of books. And one of the things I've observed in this work is that the citational relations between the MHS's collections and Occam's biographies, in Pilling's Occam to Edwards reference, these echo in scholarly practices of writing about early indigenous books and manuscripts, where colonial histories, geographical boundaries, and people frame the lives and literatures of indigenous peoples. I see this pattern also sometimes in the subject headings and catalogs that are applied to indigenous literatures in collections. Often, many of the texts I'm writing about are found within folders and collections that are labeled with the names of the non-native, usually white, actually always white men who collected them. Um, so this often makes the search for indigenous literatures in archives something of a slog through many materials without finding anything at all. Um, I, there's good reason, I understand, for these catalog descriptions, even as they don't always lead us to or make accessible um, indigenous literatures. We can see echoes, I think, of the MHS's desire to collect indigenous histories and place names with the goal of telling colonial histories in the tendency among scholars in multiple disciplines to read indigenous literatures and books ethnographically as a portal to the past or for insight into a tribe's practices rather than as material or literary texts that are important for what happens on the page. So this is how I arrive at my question, how to read in the archives of indigenous literatures. I've tried to think about this question in a couple of ways. One, by using archives like the MHS and others to identify the collections made by indigenous peoples. Here, I'm interested in the stories that complicate where and what the archives of indigenous literatures are and to consider their indigenous makers, readers, and users. And one such story here is one that I'm calling indigenous compilations. Indigenous compilations are intentionally assembled texts that native people made by arranging and juxtaposing textual elements on the page to make everything from scrapbooks and word lists to recipes, catalogs, and albums. So you might notice here that I'm thinking about the term archive here quite loosely, um, in that I'm not talking about a physical space, but rather considering how acts of textual compilation could create new relationships on the page among books, excerpts, words, and images. This is the same slide, just with identifying information so you know what you're looking at here. These textual compilations demonstrate the reading practices that indigenous people brought to colonial documents, ethnographic displays, and collections. Indigenous compilations also model critical perspectives on colonial archives. Second, I'm interested in how indigenous acts of engaging with colonial archives might model critical perspectives for using those repositories. One of the defining features of indigenous compilations is that their makers often sent them deliberately 
into a colonial archive or use them to engage with someone who was collecting and seeking to transform indigenous people into objects of study. So one of the revelatory moments in my research was when I made a timeline that mapped the making of indigenous compilations on the one hand and the founding or expansion of colonial archives on the other. Um, and I found that there's an extensive history of native people making compilations in a period um, starting in about 1785, 1743, um, up until the end of the 19th century when we see the foundation and expansion of archives and libraries in the United States. Um, founded in part to follow Thomas Jefferson's call to create libraries where word lists of indigenous languages could be held uh, with the expectation that um, people would be able to visit those libraries once indigenous people had vanished. Um, so we see here the rapid proliferation of archives and collections made to hold indigenous literatures, languages, and belonging. And we see against that history indigenous compilations working against and in response to and sometimes ignoring um, the archives that colonists are founding. Indigenous people made strategic decisions to send their compilations into these archives in moves that insisted on different relations to texts and archives and to colonial histories and bibliographies. Rather than appear as objects of study, indigenous people insisted on their own practices of study and analysis, modeling alternate reading practices and producing critical reflections on and corrections of settlers' assumptions and archives. So I have a couple of objectives here in my attention to this relationship between indigenous compilations and colonial archives. One is to try to decenter institutional collecting projects as the main framework for approaching and reading Native American books now held in archives and libraries. And two, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, I want to reckon with the Native places and relationships within, those, within which those archives reside. I frame the relations between archives and literary histories within the circuits created when Native people sent books into circulation. So this is to ask another set of questions. What if scholars' reading practices were shaped less by histories of antiquarianism, nationalism, patronage, and professionalism than by a recognition that reading Native books is an act of entering into the circuits those books traveled, from their makers to the archives where they now reside? How might we attune our scholarly practices of reading and curation and telling the histories of books by following both our field-specific methods for description and interpretation and by seeking to understand the reading practices that indigenous compilers themselves used. So I want to now spell out some possibilities here by examining two sets of compilations and their travels. I'll begin with a case in which a Potawatomi man made a compilation that he used to read U.S. Archives of Empire, and then I'll conclude by following the travels of a second compilation, a book of word lists that's going to eventually take us back to Pilling and his bibliographic project. So this is the first indigenous compilation that I'll discuss today. It is a small booklet. It's about three by five inches in size. It fits easily in the palm of my hand. It's printed on sheets of birch bark in 1893. Um, the booklet was written by a Potawatomi man named Simon Pokagan. And just to kind of locate you in space, Potawatomi lands are in the dark green. I'm going to quickly walk down here in what's now um, Wisconsin, Illinois, and southwest Missouri. The Pokagan Band's tribal headquarters are now in southwest Missouri. The booklet was published with two titles, as you can see here, The Red Man's Rebuke and The Red Man's Greeting. And one of the things I've been doing uh, this last year is trying to piece together the print history for these booklets and to think about the two titles and what that might have meant and why they might exist. And so I can talk more about this in the Q&A if you would like me to. Um, the booklets travel to ethnographic displays in New York and Michigan in spring of 1893 before traveling to Chicago around July of that year for the Columbian Exposition and World's Fair. The booklet announces its connection to the fair on the first page. You can see on the bottom the 1492 to 1892 dates. And uh, the illustration is hard to see, but it is, depicts Columbus's landing in the Americas. This is a reproduction of a John Vanderlyn painting that was installed in the U.S. Capitol in 1847. Commemorative stamps of the painting were made in advance of the Columbian Exposition in 1893. The rebuke and greeting circulated at the World's Fair as a souvenir and a collector's item. And it's retained this status um, in a continued afterlife as an object that's very desired by book dealers and collectors. The booklets are also indigenous compilations in a couple of ways. 
First, the birch bark pages bring together long-standing Potawatomi practices of using birch bark as surfaces for inscription and also to make objects for holding and carrying things. So we can think here about baskets and we can think about canoes among other objects. As Pokagon himself explained in the greeting, his decision to publish on birch bark is out of loyalty to my own people and gratitude to the Great Spirit, who in his wisdom provided for our use for untold generations this most remarkable tree with manifold bark used by us instead of paper being of greater value to us as it could not be injured by sun or water. The Red Man's Greetings birch bark pages materially demonstrate Pokagon's relations, what he calls his loyalty and gratitude to other Potawatomi people, to Potawatomi places and waterways, and to other than human beings like the Great Spirit. Pokagon joined these practices of inscription and communication on birch bark with print technologies. And in this way, he brought indigenous environmental and artistic knowledge into relationship with communication practices that US audiences associated with modernity. So we can see the booklet as a repository for that environmental knowledge and its ability to contain modernity and even outlast it in Pokagon's acknowledgement that birch bark lasts much longer and is more durable than paper. The greeting also reflects Pokagon's use of compilation to design its content. And so here I need to back up a bit and give you a little bit of context on the fair. Um, as I've mentioned, it's celebrating the 400th anniversary of Columbus's so-called discovery of America. And local officials in Chicago are keen to link Columbus's voyage to a narrative of national and local progress. Indigenous people were given parts to play in that narrative. And there are all these strange moments depicted in newspapers where Pokagon is cast as a historical figure in speeches meant to commemorate Chicago as a modern settler place absent of native people who supposedly only existed in the past. So in one event, he plays a historical indigenous person on a, a float that's part of a parade for Chicago Day. Fair curators and local officials tried to frame Pokagon as a character in a drama in which settler cities supersede native tribes. But this is super ironic because Pokagon is present at the fair precisely because of decades of legal advocacy on the part of his father and other members of the Pokagon Potawatomi tribe to ensure that Pokagon Potawatomi people remained in their homelands. So if in the 1790s, the Massachusetts Historical Society is framing native people within settler histories, in 1893, the fair is doing something related but slightly different. It frames native people as an origin point for the Americas and Chicago in particular, as belonging to the place of the fair, but belonging to that place only in the past, in order to argue that indigenous people have disappeared and can be mourned, celebrated, or forgotten, but not interacted with as sovereign tribal nations. So Pokagon takes up the very event that the fair sought to commemorate, Columbus's voyage to the Americas, and he used it to stage a reading of the archives of empire. Toward the end of the booklet, he excerpted selections from Washington Irving's History of the Life and Voyages of Christopher Columbus. It's first published in 1828. It goes through many reprintings in the course of the 19th century. Pokagon inserts these excerpts into the greeting. He selects quotations in which um, Columbus, in Irving's text, is describing the kindness of indigenous people, their practice of holding land in common, and the prosperity and peace that characterized their communities when Columbus arrived in the Americas. But Polkagan didn't read these quotations straightforwardly. Instead, he illuminated the archival practices through which settlers were constructing histories of Columbus and colonialism. He does this in part by effacing his reliance on Irving's text. He urges his audience to read the following, left on record by Peter Martyr, who visited our forefathers in the days of Columbus. So here, Pokagon suggests um, that Martyr visited America himself. The Italian historian does not travel to the Americas. He does produce a work of history about Columbus's voyage, but he's purely drawing on archival documents. So by detaching Irving's name as author and suggesting that Martyr traveled to the Americas, Pokagon invented archival genealogies, in this way unmooring his account from European and US historians' reliance on Columbus's journals and the other archival documents with which they reconstructed histories of colonialism. The archive of Columbus's writings and experiences was from the beginning one composed of multiple accounts from priests and historians and Columbus's family members. Pokagon excerpted from an already diffuse and proliferating archive, and he redirected those accounts to make them attend to the consequences of conquest for indigenous people. Pokagon rewrote Irving's text, in particular his descriptions of indigenous people in the Caribbean. 
So for example, Irving attributes the extremely high rates of mortality that indigenous communities experience to what he calls an unchanging nature and even a kind of desire for death rather than to Spanish actions. So you can see this in this quote here. Um, Irving claims that indigenous people decided to withhold food from the Spanish and then to withdraw from the hills, that they um, found themselves uh, so opposed to doing work that they kind of lost all desire for life. And this was why um, we see such high rates of mortality. Polkagan, on the other hand, describes this history quite differently, departing from his source while still claiming he's quoting from Irving. He comments, your historians left to be perused with shame the following facts, namely the ways that the Spanish treated indigenous people, which you see him delineate, delineate in a lot of detail in this quotation. Rather than attribute indigenous deaths to refusal to work and a, quote, weak nature, as Irving's history and many other colonial histories do, Pokagan identified enslavement, deception, and torture as responsible for the loss of indigenous lives and homelands. And he assembled the descriptions of indigenous people in the 15th century without the laudatory accounts of Spanish discovery with which they appeared in Irving's and Martyr's histories or in the fair celebrations of Columbus. So in the greeting, the excerpts serve as a record both of Columbus's voyage and due to their origin in Irving's history, a record of the ways that US settlers were currently representing those histories, framing archives, and formulating American literary histories. I think it's particularly significant that Pokagan selects quotations from Irving's history of Columbus um, to excerpt in his greeting, given Irving's reputation as one of the first internationally recognized American writers and the centrality of his work in the 1890s to the nationalist literary histories that editors are formulating in anthologies and serialized magazines. Pokagan's compilation of pieces from Irving's text addressed not just the history of Columbus and its popularity at the end of the 19th century, but the host of archiving, reading, and publishing practices through which US writers were producing histories of the continent. Pokagan then calls on his readers to adopt what might seem a surprising method of reading. After compiling the excerpts from Irving's history, he asked his readers to pause here, close your eyes, shut out from your heart all prejudice against our race, and honestly consider the above records penned by the pale-faced historians centuries ago. Tell us in the name of eternal truth and by all that's sacred and dear to mankind. Was there ever a people without the slightest reason of offense more treacherously imprisoned and scourged than we have been? In Pokagan's mode of reading, readers must pause and close their eyes. Close their eyes to what might seem familiar, to what they think they know, to prevailing assumptions about indigenous people. The forms of reading he evoked require audiences to account for long histories of colonialism and empire and to analyze Columbus's writings and actions and the methods of knowing circulating at the fair within those histories. Pokagan's compilation of colonial histories within the greeting asked people to embark on new readings of those sources and of the past. Closing their eyes allows readers to examine the colonial archive from multiple viewpoints and in several dimensions to study both the future and the past implications of colonist actions. So I'm going to turn now in this last part of the talk from acts of reading to acts of circulating indigenous compilations into colonial archives. And to do so, I'll take us from Potawatomi homelands in Chicago to Abenaki homelands in Odenak in what's now Quebec. So that's the top kind of fluorescent green dot, um, as well as in the state of New Hampshire. That's the blue dot near the White Mountains National Forest. We will also talk a little bit about Amherst, which is the lowest blue dot just above Springfield, Massachusetts. So if Pokagan offered a critical reading of the archive of histories of Columbus by excerpting and rewriting those histories, I want now to consider how sending a compilation into an archive might insist on particular uses for and relations to that archive. So to do this, I'll follow the travels of two copies of a vocabulary book in Abenaki. This list was published in 1884 by Joseph Laurent, a leader of the Odenac community within Quebec. Laurent's vocabulary was, as he notes in his preface, the first to provide a grammar in Abenaki. And subsequent US uh, ethnographers and linguists would marvel at this grammar. They had not themselves been able to produce it. Um, and so they found it very valuable for their own work as well as um, quite impressive. The dialogues also includes word lists and sentences in both Abenaki and English. Here, Laurent is building on centuries of work by Abenaki linguists, including those who instructed Jesuit priests who were struggling to learn the language in the 18th century, 
and Abenaki men who created their own translations of the books of the Bible um, from English into Abenaki in the 1830s. Some of the word lists uh, made by Abenaki men and Jesuit priests had been published in the memoirs of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1833. The list editor, John Pickering, presented the publication not as a resource for language learning, but as a historical document useful for its work to preserve um, indigenous languages and um, the exchange between the Jesuits and Abenaki linguists. Pickering said the dictionary was one of the most important memorials in the history of North American languages. He insisted, however, that its publication did not include a consideration of the use which may be made of this collection of philological materials. Word lists like those that Laurent published were for philologists and bibliographers important as memorials, important for preservation, but not for use. But when we look to Abenaki contexts and follow the travels of several copies of the book, we find that Laurent and other Abenaki people put the dialogues and their word lists to use as tools for language learning, as objects they circulated as gifts, souvenirs, and scholarly sources. Uh, a postcard, sorry, I'm on the wrong side, there we go. A postcard pasted into the front cover of a copy of the dialogues now residing in Amherst College Special Collections highlights some of these travels. The postcard is advertising a summer camp at Pequacket or Intervale. This is near the town of Conway, New Hampshire. Laurent helped establish the camp in 1884, the same year that the dialogues were published. And for the next several decades, Laurent's family and other Odenac families traveled south to spend summer months at the camp, where they sold what the postcard calls Indian wares. These include baskets, fans, canoes, bows and arrows, and pipes. This work provides Abenaki people with a rationale for continuing seasonal labor and other practices that the US and Canada sought to eliminate and replace with Western modes of subsistence. It also made possible a return across the US-Canada border to ancestral homelands. Copies of the dialogue, dialogues traveled with Abenaki families to the camp, supporting the circulation of linguistic knowledge along pedagogical, ethnographic, and touristic routes. Anthropologists from Harvard and from the universities of Pennsylvania and Chicago report regularly visiting the camp. As Laurent's youngest son, Stephen, put it, the camp became a nucleus for Indian scholars seeking out the chief, whose published grammar dictionary had become known. One of those Indian scholars, as Stephen explained, was uh, the Penn anthropologist Frank Speck, who apparently returned several times to Laurent, attempting to gather information to define what Speck called ethnic categories. Speck's repeated questions and revisions prompted an exchange in which, as Stephen wrote, his father smiled and said, well, Dr. Speck, I hope I'll live long enough to find out before I die just what kind of Indian I am. This teasing remark, I think, hints at Laurent's sense of the fault lines in the category Speck was using to try to locate indigenous people in various identity-related and historical categories. And Laurent himself engaged directly with ethnographic institutions by sending a copy of the dialogues to none other than James Pilling. A second copy of the book, now held at the Newberry Library, holds an envelope that's been pasted into its front cover. The address, written in Laurent's hand, <coughs> indicates that the gift is from Joseph Laurent, and someone, possibly Pilling, has written Indian books next to the address, which may indicate how the book was categorized upon its arrival. By sending the book to the Bureau, Laurent circulated the dialogues into the heart of linguistic collecting in the United States, to a space dedicated to arranging vocabulary lists in ways that collectors believed not only preserve indigenous languages before their supposedly imminent vanishing, but would also attach native people to places within the United States. Bureau Director John Wesley Powell wanted to use linguistic categories as a basis for federal policy, writing that language could be used to classify indigenous people and eventually, he said, to group them on reservations. Um, so this is a map that Powell made of indigenous language families. Those are color coded. Um, one thing that's important about this map is that uh, Powell has included st both state lines and in national and international boundary lines. So we have indigenous language families kind of mapped onto the geopolitical um, map of the United States. So when Laurent sent a copy of the dialogues to Pilling, he was sending it to a place dedicated to using vocabulary lists as a guide for how to locate native nations within the bounds of settler nations like the US and Canada. As the dialogues traveled into the Bureau's archival domains, or what Adrian Johns describes as dynamic localities identified by physical environment, work, and sociality, 
and associated with specific behaviors, values, and practices. Some of the book's meanings and ways of reading it were shaped by norms specific to institutions like the Bureau. But this influence didn't move in one direction, for the dialogue's content and its mobility also charted out different linguistic, geographic, authorial, and readerly categories with which to orient its uses. Like Laurent's playful refutation of Speck's ethnographic categories, we can see Laurent's decision to send a copy of the dialogues to Pilling as a move that likewise disrupts and exposes the Bureau's use of linguistic collecting to treat wordless as historical artifacts rather than living documents that are useful in the present. Returning to the Amherst copy gives us some clues into some of these uses within Abenaki communities. That copy is inscribed on one of the fly sheets by Laurent's daughter, Octavie. She was eight years old when her father established the camp, and her signature suggests she may have carried the book to and from Odenak and Pequacket, and perhaps consulted it for lessons in between selling goods to tourists or assisting with basket making. Octavie's inscription in her copy of the book suggests that the dialogues complemented the materials in Abenaki, English, and French available to students attending Odenak schools. And the book would have fulfilled Laurent's stated goal of teaching Wabanaki children English, a language useful both at Odenak and in exchanges with US tourists at the camp. Octavie's copy and its uses demonstrate that the Abenaki language isn't a static system to be preserved or transferred to paper and used as a geographic template for, for reservations, but a language that Abenaki children spoke and thought about in relationship to other languages like English. These uses for the dialogues continue as folks at Odenak still discuss returning to the camp and visiting their relations in the area. People still care for the site as well. The current home for Octavie's copy of the book at Amherst also attests to the ways that the book continues to maintain relations among, Ab among Abenaki people. The Amherst College uh, copy came to reside there in 2014 when Rhonda Bisa, who's an Abenaki beater, sold Octavie's copy of the book to the library. Bisa had obtained the book from a bookseller and she speculates it may have been sold from, sorry, stolen from the camp at some point, although it's not clear how it came to be in the hands of the bookseller. Um, Bisa said she decided that Amherst collections were a good place for the book. She noted that she felt an, a responsibility as an Abenaki to receive and take care of the book in a good way. She also explained that she wanted the book to stay close to home, meaning Abenaki homelands, and to go to someone or somewhere where it would be loved. So here, Bisa describes another use for Native American books, not just that they might enable language learning and inspire additional translations, but that they might be loved. And Bisa's act to sell the copy of the dialogues to a library close to Wabanaki homelands and to Pequawket anticipates such uses. So I want to conclude by returning to my title, Making and Reading Indigenous Archives, and to my question of how indigenous people's practices of making and reading at moments of archival formation and expansion might bear on how scholars today read in those archives. First, I think we can consider how books like Laurent's dialogues and their circulations might transform scholarly starting points and our assumptions about what archives do and what they can do in the future. For instance, could we retell histories of collecting if we begin with indigenous books, their, his their circulations, their travels to archives, and their circulations outside of colonial archives to places like the camp and back and forth between Abenaki people in the case of Laurent's book. This work might look something like reading against the archives of empire that Pokagan models and performs. It might look like learning to close our eyes or tune down the narratives that traditional disciplines teach us about historical periods, genres, and print production. It might also look something like Bisa's hope that people would interact with the dialogues by loving the book. Second, and finally, these indigenous compilations and their circuits also point us outside of colonial archives. And so I think here of how tribal nations are building their own archives with which to maintain their cultural heritage. Um, for instance, the Pokagan Band of Potawatomi Indians has purchased copies of all four of Pokagan's birch bark booklets. The rebuke and greeting are only one of the birch bark booklets he made. So they purchased copies of them to return to their tribal archives. And the former archivist is editing a contemporary edition of the booklets. Um, I think also of the work that um, libraries like the Newberry are doing to revise its catalog headings and entries in order to remove offensive language or to update them with more accurate um, names for tribal nations so that people searching for materials in their nation will be able to find them. So working to make the catalog both more accessible and more accurate. From this vantage point, 
Colonial archives are one node or point in a more extensive map of indigenous books and indigenous people's circulation of and care for those books. Thanks a bunch. I'm happy to take questions and someone can just like signal when I should take, or someone can say that I'll take the last question. Okay. Please. Were there any uh, Native Americans, tribes that had their own written language? And did they produce scholarly works in their own language? Yeah, I think pr there are many examples. I think the best example um, in this period is probably the Cherokee Nation. Um, so in the 18 teens, a Cherokee man named Sequoia invented the Cherokee syllabary. And you know, this was a, a real a deliberate uh, decision to create a, an orthography for Cherokees and by Cherokees. Uh, a minister had created an orthography for Cherokee that existed at that time. He'd worked with a, another Cherokee man to do that. Um, but Sequoia um, created a syllabary that was attuned to the ways that Cherokee sounds. And so one of the really interesting things that, that Cherokee scholars have pointed out about the syllabary is that Cherokee people learned it very, very quickly. And they've speculated that the design of the Cherokee syllabary um, aligns with the way that it sounds, making literacy very, very easy for the tribe. So Ellen Cushman is a Cherokee scholar at Northeastern who has a fantastic book called The Cherokee Syllabary that is making this argument. Uh, in 1828, the Cherokee Nation begins publishing the Cherokee Phoenix, the first uh, tribal newspaper to be published in the United States, and it's published in both Cherokee and English. So um, type for the syllabary is made in the Northeast and shipped to New Echota, Cherokee Nation within, well, it wasn't within the state of Georgia, it is within the state of Georgia now. Um, and so the newspaper, there are columns in that paper where Cherokee people are writing back and forth to each other in Cherokee uh, in the columns of the newspaper. Um, so that's just one, I think, really uh, excellent example of um, that. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for the wonderful talk. Um, I'm wondering about the findings and the like, the number of runs from things like um, um, these publications, and, and and if those are actually publishing archives, uh, such as the Red Man's Review, survive and. How many, or we know how many were published in, in, if there are multiple printings or just one, it seems like, um, yeah, it seems like important information to have. I'm just wondering if we have that. Yes. Um, I, get, I have thought about, and people, folks have asked me this question, like how many copies were published and you know what it, compared to what the number of copies in archives you know how many were lost or and so on there are about 25 to 30 copies that exist in archives in the US and Canada now um, uh, I don't have a sense of how many were published I and there are no publishing archives but I've been working to slowly piece together some story of what happened so the booklets were printed on um, the uh, uh, job printing presses of the Hartford Day Spring which is the newspaper where Pokagon's, in the town where Pokagon's publisher, who's a lawyer and businessman, his name is Sinius Ingle, he lives there, Pokagon lives close by. Um, and so they're working with the printers at the day spring in the spring of 1893 to produce the rebuke. And that's the booklet that, that's produced first. Um, sometime shortly after that, they start producing the greeting. Um, I am speculating here because I'm working from newspaper archives and trying to piece together this history. But I think the greeting is produced primarily for the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, and that the printers and Pokagon and Ingle then go back to the rebuke um, later in the decade. There's also references to Ingle having the, I think it's the rebuke and a couple of other booklets uh, printed at the day spring in 1904, uh, five years after Pokagon's death. So um, there, are, there are, I think, at least like four, and here you, maybe you all can help me with my bibliographic terminology, issues of the rebuke. There are different title pages and dedication pages, and so clearly somebody is resetting the type for those, um, those issues. The greeting in all the editions I have been able, or all the copies I've been able to consult, is identical across those copies. 
Um, so I think it's a story that's about a collaboration with a local newspaper. Um, I think that says, like, that's a very interesting story to me about how Indigenous writers are using periodical pre uh, printing infrastructures, but also networks in order to produce and then also circulate their work. Um, and I think it's a piece of ephemera that turns out to have this longer life than maybe Pokagon initially and Ingle thought it might um, have. So that's like what I know at this point. It's, um, it's still a little bit of a work in progress, but it's very piecemeal in terms of the archive, and I certainly wish there were more. Um, my question is, I noticed that aside from your, um, the title of your um, film, you, it seemed very deliberately used indigenous compilation versus colonial archive. And you talked a little bit at the end about, um, uh, you know, remaking, you know, the, the, the uh, empire and archive. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the politics of the choice of your language yeah. as a scholar. Yes. Um, thank you for that question. Um, um, so a couple of things to say. One, some of the really helpful work, as I was thinking about these terms, um, came from early modern studies book historians who are thinking about compilations. And here they mean books that um, individuals are having kind of bound together. They're kind of making their own um, compilations out of books they're buying separately. There's also fantastic work on things like scrapbooks and commonplace books as being compilations. So that was really important for kind of thinking about the ways that there is actually a long history of compilation making and practices that isn't necessarily indigenous. Um, it's also the case that when I started working on this project, the things that I were, was finding were um, word lists and things like albums and scrapbooks made by colonists. And so it seemed, compilation could seem to be a very kind of colonial practice and in fact, it does have a history in the Americas as being a kind of bureaucratic documentary genre that is used to try to um, hold in place uh, the meanings of indigenous words and to kind of pin indigenous people to the page as objects of study. The etymology of compilation um, can mean, it's, it's kind of history, is it's a word that can mean to assemble and bring together. It also has connotations of plundering. And so I wanted to bring those together to think about the ways that indigenous people in the 18th and 19th century made these decisions to assemble materials of texts that might be something made by a colonist, might be something that comes from their own community, and to kind of do so in this larger context in which their archives are being plundered. Um, that is a history that precedes the 18th and 19th century, but it intensifies at that moment. And so indigenous compilation kind of helped me think about what acts of assembling could do in these moments of, and contexts of plunder. Um, indigenous people keep archives, and only, it's certainly the case that there are only colonial archives and there can never be an indigenous archive. Um, but I wanted a way to try to think through how, you know, the places where the archives that I um, rely upon to do my work have these origins um, in this premise that they are going to be places where, that are kind of predicated on an assumption of indigenous vanishing a kind of um, settler colonial expectation of replacement and elimination. Um, and so I think that I'm interested in thinking through and grappling with what it means to do work in those places that certainly have done, like one of the wonderful things about doing this project was seeing all the ways that staff at libraries are working against and that his, those histories and working to tell them and working to change the relationship of their institutions to indigenous communities. Um, but also wanting to make sure we acknowledge those histories as a way to grapple with how things are organized and the assumptions that um, the people who put the collections together might have made when they assembled them. I hope that gets toward what you're thinking. Thanks for the question. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I noticed in your uh, introduction that you talked about the dictionary that matched English words with Abenaki words. It seemed to be translating Western Christian vocabulary into Abenaki, and I wonder if the volume contains the reverse with concepts known only to the indigenous community um, translated into English. Yeah, thank you for that question, um, which lets me talk about a piece of that work that I didn't get to put into the talk. Um, so let me think about where to start. Uh, yes, one of the very cool things that uh, the, the book does, so you're right in noting that 
this is very much a kind of like, we're going to start with God's attributes. Um, it, it's a very much a kind of hierarchical organization. So we're going to start with God. We're going to come through the heavens. We're eventually going to work our way down to people. And there are going to be animals and plants. Um, and there's, it seems to be a kind of hierarchy of being. Um, there's, I don't have an image of this list, I'm sorry to say. Um, but there's a, there's a word list that starts to put together things that don't seem to fit in the same list. And the title of that list is Meteors, Ships, Etc. Um, <laughs> which I think is like one of my favorite titles for a list ever. And one of the things that I think that list is doing is um, you know, giving Abenaki words for things like comets and meteors and thunderstorms and ice and fog. Um, and, and when you read that list alongside uh, um, his, Abenaki history of colonization um, published around the same time as the, the dialogues, um, one of the things that I think becomes clear is that the word list kind of contains the elements of or maps onto that history of colonization. So one of the Abenaki histories of colonization is that um, a meteor precedes the arrival of um, colonists who arrive in ships, that there's a kind of fog or vapor that comes over the land, and that a um, woman who appears in the form of a, a swan sort of gives the Abenaki people advice for what to do. She says, these people are going to come. Uh, here are some tools you're going to need to kind of survive in this new world. Um, and, and things kind of play out, as she says. So when we, you know, it looks very much like a, um, like an, a evidence of assimilation or Levon, who is Catholic, saying, um, you know, let me just sort of transform uh, or put Abenaki in the terms of um, this kind of Western system. But when we read it alongside Abenaki histories, a, a different kind of an additional context emerges for what he's doing with the word lists. There's also his son, Stephen, does all this kind of great um, translation work and his papers in the APS. And one of the things he says about the earlier um, 18th century work with the Jesuit priest is that the Abenaki men working with them are translating kind of pieces of the Catholic liturgy um, into terms that would have been familiar for Abenaki people. So the manger was like the bows on which the baby laid. Um, and he's like, there, is a, there, are, there are so many references to corn. So give us our daily bread becomes give us our corn cakes. Corn, of course, is a super important um, plant and crop for Abenaki people. So even in the moment where it looks like this is you know, simply Catholic theology getting imposed on Abenaki people, Abenaki people are turning it around and transforming it into the terms that are central for, and the relationships that are central for them. Here's what uh, the review strikes me as, again, sometimes uh, the inverse of winter drawings. Oh, yeah, that's really um, interesting. Like it, it's taking uh, non Western support and putting a Western form onto it, whereas the weather drawings kind of taking Western support and putting indigenous economic things mm -hmm, onto it. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of curious how. How do you think about like what place the something like weather drawings has in the story of the film? Yes. Thanks for that question. I really appreciate thinking about the kind of um, form and and kind of surface. So if folks don't know what ledger drawings are, maybe I'll just say this is a primarily a kind of plains practice of taking um, uh, uh, practices of drawing on uh, hide and animal skin and uh, drawing instead on, and, and the practices of drawing on hide would tell histories. So there might be one for a year, there might tell important events, um, uh, and with the arrival of colonists and soldiers on the plains, with them comes ledger paper. And so um, pe indigenous people took um, sheets that were meant to keep ledgers. Um, they also take things like sketchbooks. There's also a record of um, uh, uh, military target paper. And they turn them into surfaces for drawing these histories. So there are wonderful collections of, um, of these that survive. And many of them are digitized, so you can see them online. Um, so, let me, so let me think about this. You know, I, one of the things I would say is that I think compilations are in some ways a kind of textual relative to ledger art in that one of the things that ledger art is doing is arranging and compiling the pieces of a story on a page. And you don't read it left to right. Um, the horizon and time work in really different ways than our kind of like the Western uh, art historical mind would have been trained to read these things. Um, 
you know, I think for Pokagon, one of the things he's drawing from are practices of using birch bark as a surface for pictographs. And that's not unlike the ledger art work to sort of create forms. Um, and I, you know, so I think one of the things we could say is that these things are interconnected sort of um, practices of using and adapting indigenous art to the paper or the technologies that are coming their way. I think I'm kind of just re-saying what you said very smartly, which is so I guess it's just to say, yes, I agree with you. Thanks for that great observation. Kelly, you know, your knowledge is amazing and um, your talk was perfect. So thank you so much. We're very grateful to you. Let's show our appreciation. <laughs>